Okay, I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Demet Dinlar and I'm a lecturer in anthropology and international development at the School of Global Studies next door, uh, University of Sussex. And today I have the great honor and pleasure to chair uh, this exciting Sussex development lecture delivered by Professor Mario Novelli. Mario Novelli is professor in the political economy of education at the University of Sussex. He is a member and former director of the reputable Center for International Education, which is one of the major centers contributing to flagship Sussex Development Studies programs. He previously held academic positions at the University of Bristol and University of Amsterdam, and has a very interdisciplinary approach across various fields covering education, international development, geography, amongst others. His research looks into the relationship between globalization, peace building, and education, learning and knowledge production in trade unions and social movements. He made significant contributions to the field of education through his critical political economy lens. In 2020, Mario was awarded Global Challenge Research Fund Network Plus Grant in partnership with universities in the UK, South Africa, and Kazakhstan, which, will, which is building capacity and knowledge exchange in Central Asia and Southern Africa with a political economy analysis of education systems in conflict affected context. Starting from his PhD, looking at trade unions, learning and opposition to privatization in Colombia, and later on the killing and persecution of teachers also in Colombia, Mario has been a truly engaged activist scholar, collaborating, co-designing and co-producing research and knowledge with social movements and labor unions. Long before the impact case study became such a trendy issue in the UK, Mario has been a devoted academic making in my humble opinion, a huge impact in real life. Mario is not only a great researcher and activist, he is also a great colleague, very much respected union activist, teacher, mentor, so generous with his time and the possibilities he opens up in the increasingly competitive environment of the academia, which can be very alienating for junior researchers. And I'm actually the first hand witness of this, Mario was in the recruitment committee, which awarded uh, my first fellowship at Sussex. And from the point of time I arrived to Sussex, he has not ceased to support me in every way. In fact, he showed me that it is possible to be a successful, established senior professor and a caring, generous person at the same time. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> when Mario gave his professorial lecture a few years back at Sussex, I had the chance to meet many of his collaborators and former colleagues and students from different universities who had traveled from various countries in the world to attend this lecture in person. During the reception after the lecture, everyone was asking each other with a drink, how do you know Mario? And everyone had a fantastic story to tell. It was a story of research, a story of friendship, a story of teaching, collaboration, activism, social struggle which apparently left long lasting legacies everywhere he went. Sussex and IDS take pride in being number one in development studies in the uh, world university rankings. And Murray is one of the contributor to our university's development programs. In our attempt to decolonize development, we try to bring the voices of the global South, labor unions, social movements, indigenous communities, not as objects of study, but as agents of change, as collaborators. I do not know, however, how many of us had the eloquence to demonstrate in the depth Mario has how those moments are also engaging in theory building rather than being an object of study by theories. The research we will hear today from Mario is a research conducted by a brilliant team that Mario will be talking about in a bit in four countries, Colombia, South Africa, Turkey and Nepal, together with social movements and NGOs. The research shows that those movements are not innovative in modes of action, but in modes of analysis, which can indicate strategic directions for the future with the potential to transform radical theory itself. As an activist who spent long years in my home country, Turkey, I recognize how crucial and transformative such an approach is. I myself had to revise many of my assumptions about activism and social change in my engagement with social movements. Social moments can be, some, can be sometimes much more agile than academics because they quickly realize when some need conceptual tools 
be it class or state theory, do not fit the complexity of real life they want to act upon. Especially in context of crisis and conflict where Mario worked, those movements are obliged to engage in doing quickly conjunctural analysis for a new situation, solving problems and managing multiple crises. Those theoretical and practical challenges push them to innovate. And what I can see from this amazing research is that Maria and his team asked the right questions to uncover those innovations. And I very much believe that the book which comes out of the research will be groundbreaking. But social movements are not simply producers of knowledge. They also seek with great appetite and curiosity to learn from others. They do not want to be self-enclosed entities. They want to equip themselves with all the resources and forms of knowledge possible in their struggles. That's why transnational solidarities are so crucial for local movements, which I myself could observe in implementing training programs. And Mario dedicates so much time and energy to bring together social movements in different countries for cross-fertilization and mutual learning. In the context of a global attack on labor and communities, I believe that he is one of those people who activate neural networks of collective intelligence of resistance at the global scale and collective imagination for a better future. So I want to thank him here for being a source of inspiration for all of us. Before Mario starts speaking, just a few words about logistics. The lecture will last 45 minutes and we'll have 40 minutes for questions and answers and discussion. We will take questions from the floor and from the Zoom um, with the uh, help of our uh, organizers, uh, lecture organizers. The session is recorded and the recording will be available after the event. If you would like to share the event on social media, please use the, do not forget to use the hashtag Sussex Dev, and we will invite you for a drink at the end of the event as well at IDS Bar. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Demet, for your very kind words, and thanks everybody for uh, not taking advantage of the rare appearance of the sun in this country um, and joining me today, and thanks everybody that's online as well. Um, I'm very happy to uh, have a chance to talk about this book, which, be, which has been um, about seven years in the making. Um, and uh, I'm also going to kind of try and hone in a little bit on this issue of solidarity, which is the theme of the IDS lecture series for this for this year as I go along. Um, what I want to do is first start um, and really talk a little bit about the background to the research, uh, the roots of the research, the research process and methodology, which I think for, for, for us is also uh, equally important as the content, and then move on to some of the findings of the research um, in terms of how movements learn, what do they learn, and what the effect of that learning is on uh, individuals, institutions, and also societies. Um, the way that I'll do it is explore the four case studies from Colombia, South Africa, Turkey, and Nepal, but in quite a schematic way. Um, so if you are interested, and I hope you will be interested, apart from, of course, uh, getting the book, and we're currently negotiating for it to be free online, so you won't even have to pay for it, and I'm sure it'll be free anyway through the library. Um, it's really rooted and based on uh, four case studies. And so I want to now uh, just uh, recognize that this is collective presentation and my co-authors, uh, Bilgul Kutan, who is present, uh, Patrick Kane, still based in Colombia, ex-PhD student, uh, now trade union activist and worker in Colombia, uh, Adnan Celik, uh, um, colleague that uh, co-led the Turkey case, uh, Tijendra Ferrali, uh, academic at the Institute of Education, um, and Saranel Benjamin, uh, researcher and activist currently based with an NGO in, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, on the PowerPoint, which I've shared with IDS, and hopefully uh, we can share, you can get access to the, um, to the PowerPoint, you can click on to each of the um, individual case studies uh, which are at least 200 pages long, some even longer, um, with lots of rich empirical uh, detail. And also you can click onto the project website and see some of the videos that we made during the uh, process. Um, so I just want to take you back um, to 
2016, really, when this research uh, as an idea really emerged, not out of a grant and not out of um, uh, really a kind of academic process, but really more of a solidarity process. It was early 2016, um, the Turkish military had started bombarding Kurdish areas of Turkey um, after the collapse of the peace talks. And we wanted to kind of raise the issues on the campus um, and brought together a number of colleagues uh, from Turkey to do a session on Turkey, the Kurds and human rights. And that was fo then followed up in October um, with a broader one day workshop on social movement learning and struggles for social justice, where we brought uh, the different movements from Nepal, Turkey, Colombia, and South Africa together to talk about these issues of learning, knowledge making in social movements. It was a time in the UK when prevent was very strong, when the university had been accused of not reporting enough people to prevent. Uh, and the idea of being a radical was seen as a fundamentally negative thing. And we wanted to try to raise that issue and to, uh, and, and to make the case that radicalism is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and uh, um, we did that through bringing together and hopefully opening up those debates to students. And that led to a special issue of uh, Red Pepper, a uh, left-wing magazine that maybe uh, many of you know, uh, based in the UK, edited by Hilary Wainwright, famous, well-known feminist uh, activist. Um, so that was the roots of it. But during that time, we started to engage in dialogue with a range of these leaders. Um, and the idea came up that perhaps we could get some funding. And uh, out of those discussions, um, and through their input, um, I took the lead on, re on, on writing an ESRC grant. And surprisingly, and I was the most surprised as, as anyone in that, we actually managed to gain the funding for that research. And, and that allowed us then to embark on this uh, research project. Um, so I want to now talk a little bit about, um, just give you a very brief background to each of the movements uh, that we were involved in. Um, the Housing Assembly, uh, on the right of your screen uh, in South Africa was formed in 2009 and uh, was a homeless movement that emerged out of housing, str housing struggles for shack dwellers in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, it has grown to a movement uh, that is located in over 20 different communities with over 400 frontline activists. In a context of post-apartheid South Africa, they organized uh, across ethnically divided housing geographies, a women's led movement with the house as a central organizing unit. For the housing assembly, education of both members and marginalized communities was a, was a central strategic focus. The second organization, NEMAF, uh, the Nepal Madash uh, Foundation was founded in 2007 and organizes amongst marginalized communities in the Terai region of Southern Nepal, bordering India. Historically marginalized, underrepresented in civil service, state and elites, and a mix of marginalized caste and Muslim communities, NEMAF works for economic, social and political rights of communities um, and fights for the dignity of the Madesh community. Um, NEMAF works both in the Terai region, supporting communities and movements, and also in the capital, Kathmandu, trying to raise awareness of the situation of Madesh to the broader Nepali public. The third movement, Nomadesk, and the Intercultural University of the Peoples, which Nomadesk created, um, was created in 1999 in Cali, in the southwest of Colombia. Nomadesk emerged out of trade union struggles and the defense of human rights of social leaders and activists. Based on both a human rights critique and a recognition of the lack of social movement interaction across the southwest of Colombia, it has sought to bring together trade union, black movements, peasant farmers, women's movements, students and indigenous communities, initially through a diploma in human rights and later through the creation of the Intercultural University of the Peoples, it has worked with over 800 leaders and activists of these movements 
and supports and provides them with human rights and advocacy assistance. And the third movement, uh, the fourth movement, the HDK, the People's Democratic Congress in Turkey was established in 2011 and brings together various social and political movements from across Turkey with a broad-based peace and social justice agenda, bringing together left movements, Kurdish and ethnic and religious minority movements. It has come to provide a platform for broad sections of society who have long been marginalized in an authoritarian Turkey. It emerged during a period of peace process and negotiations between Turkey and Kurdish national liberation movement and is rooted in notions of radical democracy. Democracy. It has built the Congress through mass participation and engagement in a variety of assemblies and processes. In 2012, the HDK formed its own political party and despite repression, gained over 10% of the vote in national elections and has gone on to become a major political oppositional electoral force. Since the collapse of the peace process, HDP and HDK have suffered massive and widespread repression, imprisonment and harassment of leaders and activists. So now I want to kind of give you, now I've given you a bit of a background of the movement. I want to give you a bit of a background to the rationales of the research, um, which I touched a little bit upon in, in, in terms of the uh, initial events that we organized. But I think that there are kind of two principal uh, arguments that we were drawing upon uh, in the research. The first one uh, is that social movements matter, and they matter particularly in periods of austerity, uh, war, conflict, increased inequality, and are often on the front line of defending marginalized communities across the world. And the second is a kind of uh, intellectual, in a sense, critique of mainstream academ academia. Um, and what we argue is that social movement, knowledge production and learning has been key to the historical evolution of social scientific thought. Central this art to this argument is both a critique of top-down knowledge, which presumes that academics theorize and social movements produce empirical knowledge and receive theory, to a much more grounded understanding that social movements at the point of practice and praxis build knowledge from below that can move scientific thought forward and change the world. Uh, Lawrence Cox, uh, Aziz Chowdhury, uh, Shukatis and Graeber argue that those at the coal face suffering the harshest contradictions of contemporary neoliberal capitalist development have privileged knowledge about the nature of the system under which we all reside. Similarly, it is when academics engage with social movements that provides the most fruitful and most fruitful potential for breakthroughs in social science. Critical theory owes its roots to intellectuals engagement with social movements, not just Marxism, but feminism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism. However, since the 80s onwards, critical theory, particularly in the USA and Western Europe, has often become distanced from grassroots struggles and has developed in very particular directions. This has made it less relevant and powerful and also distorted its focus. As Lawrence Cox notes, and I quote, in the period often taught as foundational, it was not only Marx and Engels whose thought was shaped by the movements that shaped their world, Weber, the conservative opponent of socialism, and Durkheim, the Republican secular pope, both formed their thought in dialogue with movements. The, the same is true for the revitalization of sociology from the 1960s. The arrival of feminism and Marxism within the academy, the growth of of post-colonial and Foucauldian approaches, the struggles of scholars identifying as gay or lesbian, migrant or minority, and the methodological challenges represented by participatory feminist and other approaches were all shaped by social movements. Part of the, the argument that we are developing here also feeds into a broader debate around the decolonization of knowledge that the subaltern knowledges of social movements in their worker, indigenous, feminist, black, anti-racist forms have been silenced, undermined, hidden through processes of both imperialism and elitism that have prior prioritized Northern knowledge over Southern knowledge, 
university knowledge over social movement knowledge, elite academic over movement intellectual, middle class knowledge over working class and peasant knowledge, male knowledge over female, traditional intellectuals over organic intellectuals. To be clear, ours is not a binary plea for the abandoning of universities as sites of knowledge making, but more so for reconnecting and reinvigorating them alongside a recognition and vindication of alter alternative ways of knowing and thinking. And part of the education angle to this is that when social eruptions happen, as we see in some of these pictures that no doubt bring back memories of major social uprisings of the past, there are many things that led to those processes that are often hidden and not revealed. Uh, Gramsci, the Italian communist, uh, notes that every revolution has been preceded by an intense labor of criticism. In reference to the French Revolution, he argued that the bayonets of Napoleon's armies found their road already smoothed by an invisible army of books and pamphlets that had swarmed out of Paris in the first half of the 18th century and had prepared both men and institutions for the necessary renewal. And a more recent quote from uh, Casas Cortes talking about the role of knowledge making in social movements. He says, in their effort to pursue or resist social and political changes, these actors do not limit themselves to protesting in the streets or the squares. Rather, they form collective spaces of knowledge production, wherein collaboration and participation lead to the rethinking of democracy, the generation of expertise and new paradigms of being, as well as different modes of analysis of relevant political and social conjunctures. Now, in terms of understanding where education fits in and learning to this process, we need to take a much broader uh, approach than is often the case with education, where it's often equated with schooling. Um, the processes of social movement learning are, as uh, Giff Foley talked about, both formal, incidental, informal and non-formal, and take place in a range of places, in struggles, across struggles, in non-formal spaces of uh, education that are structured, sometimes in formal spaces of education, but often learning as activists and movements move along. Um, so a question about what do movements learn and make knowledge about, um, uh, classically, we can see that social movement knowledge has often operated at three levels. A thematic critique, why is the world like it is? A strategic cr critique, how can we change it? And that in terms of both the tactics, but also the kind of institutions that we create in order uh, to do that. The centralized party, the umbrella organization, the popular front, etc. And thirdly, a utopian alternative vision. Um, what would we like the world to be? Uh, and that can be small or big in terms of the aspiration. Um, Beckett Harlow, researcher on social movements and education, makes a critique of the current literature, arguing that there is a gap between social movement literature, which is often um, quite structured and quite distant from the activities of activists, and the Frarian inspired kind of pedagogic literature that emerged out of research of Paolo Freire, um, uh, which is good on the kind of individual transformation through participatory pedagogies, but not so good about thinking about how movements are built, how they strategize, how they develop. So she argues, and we agree with, that critical pedagogues need more organizational thinking and social movement scholars need a more pedagogical focus. So the key approach that we had, we wanted to do three very simple questions. How do movements learn and make knowledge? What do they learn about? And what is the effect of that learning? And we wanted to do that through a participatory process with the four movements. Uh, and the leader of the uh, methodology came from the Columbia team. And it was a, a methodology called the Systematisation de Experiencias, which comes out of Frarian uh, pedagogy, uh, 
participatory action research, which I'm sure if you're from IDS, many of you know the history of that, Colombian for Orlando, uh, Orlando Fast Border, uh, which is really a kind of recognition. It's an approach that recognizes that movements themselves are the best ones to understand the challenges, the histories, the struggles, and the strategies, uh, and that you should create the spaces through which you can work with movements for, to go through a reflective process. And so we carried that out with four teams across four countries, across four movements, but we also wanted to facilitate the movement of activists across movements. And so we organized trips uh, for leaders and activists of the movement to go to different parts of the world, both to work on the project, so several days working on the project, thinking through the project, but the other side, meeting activists from each of the different contexts, understanding their struggles and trying to build solidarity and relationships. First meeting in Nepal, second meeting in Turkey, third meeting in Colombia. You'll see there, you see, we held an event in Bogota, which was about the Kurdish revolution in Turkey and tried to build some solidarity with students and activists on those issues. Um, we didn't manage to get to South Africa. COVID broke out. That was moved online, unfortunately. Um, so we didn't manage to take the team to South Africa, which was a, a, a great disappointment. And the research itself kind of slowed down during that period, like many, uh, which I'm sure you're experienced with in many of your research. But I guess the, the key um, points the research process was bottom-up, participatory, co-led. Research was needed to be valued not only by us as the researchers, but the movements themselves. And they needed products to come out of that in their own languages, um, tailored to their needs. Uh, we shared resources and control of decision-making. We agreed that the process was important as a product. We had a strong focus on gender diversity in both focus and the composition of all the re research teams with researchers from all of the countries uh, reflected. Um, and it was both a research project and a knowledge exchange process with what False Border would call uh, Dialogo de Saberes um, and a study of knowledge making and learning through a process of knowledge making and learning. And I think that all the authors and participants would agree that we went on a really high learning curve during this period. And it was rooted in a spirit of solidarity, internationalism, long-term relationships and connection to the movement. With the Colombian organization, I've worked with those for over 20 years. Uh, so sustained relationships over that period since I lived there in the late 1990s. So moving on to the research findings. Um, if you go to the research reports or you go to the chapters, you'll see that what we've tried to do is really let the activists and the participants speak, speak for themselves uh, with lots of information. And I'm going to try and kind of pull out some of the key uh, um, issues here quite schematically and then just pull out some quotes that illustrate that. But in terms of how do movements learn and make knowledge, I started with this idea that you first of all need to understand that there are different types of learning, so formal, informal, incidental, non-formal. And as we move through the project, we recognized um, that these were quite technical and felt quite technical. And actually what we wanted to capture was this kind of relational and situated understanding of some of these diverse spaces of learning, the subjects involved, um, and, you know, it made us realize that education is always a relational process. It occurs in particular contexts with particular actors at particular moments and that we needed to take those seriously. And similarly, we recognized that there was a real issue around the temporalities of learning. Um, one example was this sense that when we interviewed activists, they would talk about these rapid, intense periods of learning in the midst of struggles. And then these periods afterwards where you would sit back, some people talked about these in between times, in between the ups, there was the downs and there was different types of processes where you might reflect. And out of the uh, uh, Turkey case study, 
Um, they developed this idea of looking at uh, the way movements learn in the struggle, so in the midst of struggle, learn from the struggle, looking back in the past at the history of movements that have preceded them, and learn to struggle, projecting forward the skills that they may need to develop amongst their members, cadres, uh, in order to succeed. Um, we also explored the different subjects of social movements, yeah, which was, you know, sometimes leaders, activists, local communities, the general public, uh, friends, enemies. There was a range of educational processes that were involved in that. And we also came to understand emotional dimensions, struggles inside the movement as well as outside, which were often more important, no? We can think about social movements battling against something, no? but actually internally, there are a range of battles around equalities issues, uh, who is leading, who is following, controls of resources, organizing democracy within the institutions, within the movements, et cetera. Um, and also um, the relationship between activist learning as kind of individual processes and the way that movements learn. Thinking about learning by doing or learning in, one HDK activist notes, of course, you learn a lot of things. For example, you learn how to write a press release, you learn how to read a press release, how to negotiate with the police, how to act towards the police when your friend is detained, which actions will cause you to be beaten or what you need to avoid to, to avoid being beaten. You learn from experience and from the environment. Of course, there are people more experienced than you and you are more experienced than others. You share your experiences. And if some of our friends are born to write press releases, some were good writers and others were not. In actively, actively engaging with these struggles, informally and incidentally, Activists learn skills, develop tacit knowledge about society and see things in different ways. They learn from others and they learn from themselves. They also learn from these key events that I mentioned. The housing assembly in South Africa, the poor shack dwellers movement was born out of an eviction in post-apartheid South Africa. In 2008, a group of landless and homeless families had occupied land in Cape Town. They erected structures out of scrap materials. On that piece of land, there was no access to water or toilets. The families, including children and babies, stayed in these conditions for months. Every day they were violently and repeatedly evicted by the city of Cape Town's anti-land invasion unit. Every day the homeless families would dismantle and bury the materials and use, use to build their shacks. In the evenings, they would dig up their materials and reconstruct their houses. This was the only way they could prevent their daily evictions and destruction of their homes. As if this was not enough, violence and cruelty, one of the families lost their baby and had to bury the body of the baby in the same place where they would bury their scrap materials for their homes. This powerful story has been told so many times by the founding members of the Housing Assembly and is deeply embedded in the historical memory and DNA of the movement. It is the story that has formed the core of their struggle. And in many of the other movements, whether it's Gezi Park, Sintram Kali in Colombia, uh, the Madesh uprisings, the movement and its members learn and often analyze uh, from key events. Um, uh, the events become the foundation, uh, the point at which different reality is viewed and new possibilities become visible. And this takes some of the work of Alain Badiou and his argument around the importance of the event in the history of consciousness of movements of populations. We also found that people learn intergenerationally from older comrades, younger comrades around uh, uh, the history of, of movements and the different attitudes. And this is a, a quote from the Housing Assembly. Uh, the first time I was taken to Ilrig, which is a social activism center in Cape Town, I met Michael Blake. If ever I was confused, it got even worse. It sounded like the comrades were speaking a language I would never understand. Michael is a wonderful teacher. He introduced me to new things and new people like Kone. And together with the staff of Ilrug and Workers World Media, I began to see light at the end of the tunnel. Don't get me wrong, the light is faint, but at least I see it now. 
From what I have learned and experienced this far, there's not much new in our immediate struggle. Most of what we are going through and experiencing had already happened to others. Even worse, learning from all of the other struggles and comparing it to ours taught me a lot. I could learn from the mistakes of others had made to always put me ahead of where I'm supposed to be. And this inter intergenerational process played out in all of the countries reflecting on the role of history and the role of movements. Similarly, we have this issue of learning to preparing activists for skills. Uh, in, the Madesh, in the case of the Madesh, um, a Madesh activist notes, I was in the college during the first Madesh movement. The Federal Socialist Forum had organized an interaction program in our college. There, for the first time, I got to know how Madeshis were being marginalized. Their agenda deeply interested me in the college ho hostel. We, Madeshi girls, used to face discrimination but had never thought about it from a political perspective. Slowly I came to realize broader structural issues in our society. Then I began to participate in various interaction programs at schools and colleges. I also received training on how to politically educate and mobilize people for the struggle. So you can see through that, the way that organizations develop consciousness of, of, of activists to help them to start to understand the conditions that they are, and that it's not necessarily their own fault, that it's about the way that societies are structured. And I'm going to uh, move on to the emotional dimensions, which I think was important as well in all of the cases, and give a, a, a quote from the HDK, where they talk about how, I remember our first General Assembly, it was so inspiring, it was the first time in Turkish history where we saw different people and groups coming together with their own identities and beliefs. We came to realize that our difference and diversity was a positive thing, that we could learn from each other. Everyone was in shock to see so many diverse opinions, beliefs and identities that for so long had been denied and excluded. Ahmet Turk, a veteran Kurdish politician said, I have been waiting such a long time to see this scene. Now that I have seen it, I will not die in disappointment. I will never forget his comment. And it was those kind of sense of emotional, kind of visceral feeling uh, that we experience, joy, pain, hope. In Colombia, the ritual of remembering the people that had been assassinated by the police, by the military, recalling their names, chanting their names out, was often part of the kind of visceral glue that held some of those organizations uh, together. Uh, and now, I'm gonna to move to uh, what they organizations uh, learnt about um, and begin that by just saying that from all of the case studies, there is an evident shift in social movement thinking and theorizing in the global South, a renewed interest, interest in endogenous knowledge and a reinvigorated skepticism about Northern solutions to Southern problems that is often symbolically linked to the image of the Zapatistas, but more recently demonstrated in the decolonial turn and a renewed recognition of the legacies of colonialism and the ongoing impacts of imperialism. A strengthened commitment to the environment and a resultant questioning of industrialization and urbanization as necessary or inevitable development trajectories. Questioning of the privileged revolutionary subject, whether that be the working class or the peasantry, and consequently a renewed interest in identity and its relationship to social struggle, black movement, women's movement, indigenous movements. Our case studies are not all telling us the same stories, but there is evidence in all of them of a new endogenous self-confidence, a new looking inwards as well as outwards for struggle resources. Furthermore, when movements look at outside for inspiration, then these days they are less likely to look to the global north and more likely to other movements in the South for innovative ideas, strategies, and new directions. Similarly, while solidarity was key to all the case study movements, it was often focused primarily on the intermovement and intersectional rather than the international. Where it was international, it was often regional and less focused on linking to centers of global capitalist power in the North. Perhaps this is a further demonstration of the decline of the global North as a beacon of progress, even if this was always a myth, 
and a reflection of its moral and intellectual decline. Nor was there any evidence in our research, unlike during the Cold War, that social movements were looking to either China or Russia for new and fresh thinking, resources, support and solidarity. If anything, the inspirational transfer has been in the other direction, with Western social movements inspired by the Zapatistas, the Piqueteros, Rojava, the Bolivarian and Venezuelan revolutions and others. Finally, the end point is much less teleological than earlier movements and struggles, encapsulated in the phrase, we make the road by walking. From the mode of post-capitalist existence, socialism, communism, or something else, to the target of power, the state, social movements are reimagining and rethinking goals, destinations, and endpoints that reflect concerns arising out of historical reflections that start to reframe what success looks like and what victory means. At the heart of all these processes of innovative practice are new ideas and ways of thinking that merge, emerge out of praxis, emerge out of the tensions and frictions between what social movements aspire to do and the temporal, economic, social, political, and cultural context which shapes the limits of the possible. Out of this process emerges new ways of thinking and being, of conceptualizing problems and solutions, of testing out alternatives and modifying strategy. The movement becomes both a school for learning new things, new skills, new ideas, and a laboratory where strategies are tested and new ways of framing and shaping ideas emerge. And I won't go through uh, the detail of that in order to keep going, but um, I think those areas are important. Um, the final area that we looked at was what was the effect of that learning on knowledge making of the on the movement, its members, and the struggle of the movements. Now, this is a tricky thing because effect, cause and effect in social movement research um, is difficult in the sense that there are many movements struggling and it's difficult to identify the particular movements and their roles. Um, and sometimes uh, movements succeed where they fail and fail where they succeed. And we have cases of that, you know, in, in the case of the HDK, um, their success, massive success in a short period of time led to one of the massive, most serious um, moments of repression and violence in Turkey uh, that led to mass incarceration of many of the activists and leaders. Uh, in Colombia, uh, the movement uh, has been successful, but with great challenges. Yeah? So thinking about success uh, is a hard one. And also thinking about it in terms of into individual transformation, uh, institutional and also societal, uh, I think was important. Um, there are a range of uh, areas that we try to isolate from the data, uh, from individual victims to collective subjects, epistemic struggles, shifting discourses, repression and resistance during times of authoritarianism, and different types of organizational models. Um, and I'm just going to give you a few quotes before I wrap up. Um, on this issue of uh, individual victims to collective subjects of struggle, I think in all of the uh, case studies, we saw how people were transformed through the process of engaging with movements from being a victim of often fierce state repression, uh, um, marginalization, to feeling a, a agency, feeling part of a collective struggle. Um, this is a quote from HDK uh, activist. HDK made me notice my own worth. A stronger woman came out of this process. And most importantly, I gained this, I mean, I had already for my family, I mean for my society, all my interests, my love, my worries. I say this as a comment. HDK gave me all these identities. I feel myself as an Armenian, a Syriac, a Circassian, or a Pomak. In other words, HDK gave me a lot. You have one Hatijay in front of you talking to you, but in fact, this Hatijay that you are talking to here contains in her health, in herself, all of the existing and extinct identities of my society on this land. HDK created out of me a multi-identity, multilingual, multicultural woman. We also saw how the epistemic was transformational, the way that people thought 
about the conflict. One of the founders of the HDK and a prominent revolutionary from the 68 period talks about how HDK has proved that one never stops learning. First of all, you face the reality about Kurdistan. You see the life there and the truth. This is an amazing richness. Actually seeing this opens your eyes to all. You start seeing the Armenian, the Rum, and then it allows you to have a new look on the Turk. Your whole perspective on life is reinvented. I can't imagine any possibility of learning greater than this one. And from Colombia, uh, from a participant in the university, Intercultural University of the Peoples, uh, we have this quote, which shows how the shifting way that people are framing the conflict. The indigenous movements of today, of today are not the same as the indigenous movements of a few years ago. And nor are the peasant movements, nor is the black movement or the urban movement the same today. So this interculturality is also a dialogue with time, with the historical identities, but also with these new identities that are forming. It may sound like a cliche, but forming in the heat of the struggle. That is those identities that are formed and interwoven. And in the university, process, this process has a very important class component which makes it a common identity, which exists based upon the cultural differences. These differences are there and recognized, but also there is a common identity of class and territorial defense that gives the interculturality a common purpose. It does not separate them, which is the big theoretical discussion of interculturality. It is often used to end up separating peoples, but in this case, on the contrary, it ends up by uniting them through dialogue. Finally, on this issue, I want to talk about one particular person, uh, Francia Marquez, uh, a young, poor Afro-Colombian single mother who walked into the headquarters of Nomadesk in 2007 as a representative of the process of black, uh, black communities and entered into the Diploma in Human Rights. She graduated in 2008 from the Nomadesk led diploma. Project forward to the summer of 2022, and Francis, Francia Marcus, that young Afro Colombian who had entered the human rights diploma just a decade before, was elected as the first black president, vice president of Colombia. Francia, now a leader of the process of black communities, was part of the Pacto Historico, the historic pact and electoral coalition that brought together movements and supporters of a wide range of social movements and progressive political organizations across Colombia, based on a very similar model from the Intercultural University of the Peoples. This victory was a huge milestone and constituted the first time in the history of Colombia that the political left had won a general election. What was amazing was not just that Francia Marquez had been elected, to one of the highest offices of the state, but that she was there as a representative of the process of black communities, a grassroots movement of Afro-Colombians that emerged out of the struggles of Afro-Colombian communities in the 90s, and one of the most marginalized and exploited sectors of the population. And in the post-election analysis in Colombia of how for the first time the left ever won, one of the arguments was that central role that Francia played in mobilizing the most marginalized communities in Colombia. And part of that knowledge of intercultural engagement, of working with different movements, was grounded in some of those processes that she'd learned uh, in those early days in Nomadesk. So just to wrap up the final points, um, I just want to say that the there is a real need, I think, to listen to social movements as a site of knowledge and resistance. Um, and there is also a need for reconceptualizing learning and education in social movements, which is often poorly understood and poorly theorized. And for movement activists and, and leaders, there's also the need for a conscious learning and knowledge strategy. Uh, one of the impacts, outcomes, from the research um, after we took the Turkey HDK delegation to Colombia uh, was one of the delegates said, after we saw what we did in Colombia, life could never be the same again. And they brought back and uh, 
uh, Gulistan, one of the members of parliament for the HDK, uh, led a process of uh, political education for the HDK, which she modeled on the Nomadesk Intercultural University of the People's model. So we have that kind of uh, relationships that emerge from that. Another point is the centrality of education in the production of post-national subjectivities. If anybody has read this recent book by Mamdani, where he talks, uh, neither natives nor settlers, where he argues that the problem of the nation state is that it was always linked to particular culture, particularly dominant culture, and that we need to move beyond that. Nancy Fraser, cannibal capitalism. The conclusions are all the same. Oppressed minorities need to work together, but the strategy, the tactic, the way to do that is the challenge. And some of the work that social movements are doing in these contexts can highlight possible ways to do that. Um, uh, you know, and that leads us to this recognition in all of the movements of diversity as not being a burden, but as a knowledge resource. Uh, and the importance of uh, uncovering, uh, vindicating alternative knowledges, different ways of thinking. Um, it's also the case that in our research, we find no magic bullets for social movement change. Uh, struggles are rooted in context and praxis, uh, although that is key, uh, that praxis is key to social change and the renewal of social theory. And finally, I think there are benefits for research, university, social movement, collaboration, not least uh, with the principle that nothing about us without us, this argument that we shouldn't research things that we, are, that we don't involve the people that we're researching, um, but also that social movements can reinvigorate some of the thought processes that are going on within universities around us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you very much, Maria, for this very inspiring talk. So I think James is going to help us to collect questions from the floor and from the Zoom as well. Um, Um, good afternoon. I was really inspired and felt hurt by your presentation. I'm from Mongolia and I'm also a feminist activist. So what you have shared, like all of the slides really felt like it's about me and my colleagues back in my country. Um, and I wanted to express my um, gratitude for your academic work and also this research, the book. And my question is, um, how do you see the future of um, social movement in the global so south? And as you have mentioned, there is a, like a lot of Mm, lack of resources in terms of financial difficulties we are facing within the civil society. Um, so just I wanted to hear your um, opinion on this and also would you share some of your opinion also related to collective care when we lack of the resources like material, like physical resources and there is this also need of collective care, or, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, thank you. We'll collect a few questions. Yeah. Yes. Shall we get maybe one or two more questions? Yes, Sorry, I think you said education is a relational process. And I think that um, it'd be good to speak about how that is specifically with some of your case studies. So maybe I was just, it would be nice to just have an expansion on that. Thank you. You did come to There's a question there too. Um, oh, it's going to be safe recording. 
Thank you. Hi, um, um, I really enjoyed the four case studies that you presented and I'm personally from Nepal. So yeah, uh, I wanted to ask like um, the four uh, studies that you uh, presented are so different, but yet so similar. So I wanted to know your opinion on how did cultural relativism played a role in the movements? Sure. Um, so I, I guess the first one was too difficult for me to answer. The future of social movements in the global south was a very big question, very difficult to answer. No? Um, but I always remember uh, my um, uh, comrade and social movement leader, Berenice Saleta in Colombia, uh, the founder of Nomadesk. Uh, I met her in the late 19. 90s she was in hiding in a trade union that I was working in after surviving an assassination attempt and uh, she's lived the whole of this Colombia civil war in a whole range of different ways and she always talks about social movements as being like the real Magdalena that rises and falls and at times you think that it's never going to come back but it always rises again you know and it's that sense that struggles are uneven and irregular but the realities of the system always force us to collectively resist and come back you know and often the geography of that moves uh to different parts of the world at different times you now periods when we saw latin america as the hope periods when we saw latin america as the fear no, during the dictatorships, uh, similar processes. So there is a real kind of sense of continuity there uh, in, in those processes. Um, uh, the collective care, I think, is an interesting one um, as well, that uh, there's a lot of pain and there is a lot of um, departures inside social movements. People get burnt out, worn out not just physically targeted and harassed, which also leads to those processes, but also physically and mentally exhausted, no? So those strategies of uh, collective care, um, I think have become more important. People are starting to think that. In Colombia, uh, in the headquarters of Nomades, um, underneath the main office, they started to build a therapy, place where victims of human rights abuses could go for massage, for therapy, these kinds of things. I think 20 years ago, that would have been unheard of when I first arrived in Colombia. There was a very um, strong insistence on personal sacrifice and no, not a recognition of the pain of some of these processes. Um, so I think that's a very important question. And of course, the, there, there is also a financial element to that as well in terms of collective care. And, you know, some movements have this built in. The landless movement in Brazil is famous for having a real system of economic solidarity built into their political solidarity. But many movements don't have that. So, for example, if the um, process of uh, if the landless movement in Brazil organise a popular education programme, the first thing they will say is, right, we're going to be here for the next three months. How are we going to survive? How are we going to eat? What is our economic program that will sit alongside the pedagogical one in order for us to be able to get to the end? Um, the housing assembly um, in South Africa um, was our possibly the most precarious of all the movements. Yeah, um, All of them were homeless or living in very, very um, uh, fragile situation and uh, the vast majority without any daily work. Um, and so you could see the pressure that that put on those activists, which was different from HDK, where there was a more kind of bigger institutional capacity resources to be able to support that now. So I get that, guess that, that question of um, collective care is both economic, but also social uh, in terms of the way that we think about that. Um, in terms of the question around relational processes, uh, what, what do I mean by that or what examples I would give is um, I, I have worked a bit on peace education and I've spent a lot of time critiquing contact theory. 
um, which came out of uh, um, an argument that you, if you put people together in a room uh, that are in tension, they will see each other's humanity and the issues will be resolved. And I've always argued that, you know, um, it's not about personal identity, it's about structures and inequalities, and you need to address those in tandem with that. However, <laughs> um, the case of um, oppositional movements, like we're describing, where you're bringing together different groups, is an example of a kind of radical contact theory, where all of those groups are marginalised by the current capitalist system. Uh, whether that be HDK and its constituencies, uh, Madesh, uh, um, Intercultural University of the Peoples. And then if you observe the process of education that go on, one thing is the content, what people are learning. The other thing is the process of the interaction between those different groups that historically have organized separately. You, know? you see black movements, peasants, feminists, working together across on a separate on, on this issue of human rights or, or what they're looking at but at the same time getting to know each other and so it's that's what I, what I think I mean by this kind of relational process is there starts to develop a dynamic both inside and outside of the classroom which starts to change mentalities and we saw that also in Turkey uh, through the HDK and the uh, uh, collective processes of bringing together people that whose attitudes are filtered by the state. No, we're talking about pedagogy in this process, right? We live in a society that is totally pedagogized. Bernstein said this years ago, we are manipulated by media, we're told what to agree with, what to hate, and social movements are trying to develop alternative pedagogies. And that pedagogy has to move across all of those different areas now and I think that that is part of this idea of the relational situated temporal nature of some of those pedagogical processes that we're talking about um okay so the last question was on Nepal and and culture and I, I was saying to Bidguli who is the co-author of this book that um my mentor when I did my PhD said never go near culture it's far too complicated <laughs> and <laughs> And, and uh, there is something about the research that we've done that is extremely cultural, you know? And I've watched it with my own eyes in Colombia, watching how a movement that I joined in the early 2000s, largely organized and led by Marxist uh, uh, Communist Party kind of uh, ideas um, with a quite Leninist strategy, over the years, I've seen that movement embrace different organizations and seen both those movements that they've embraced, but also themselves transform. No? So when I go back, they're not wearing the uniform anymore. They've got their indigenous bands and they're talking about uh, healing and social processes. So there is that engagement with culture. And I think that um, these processes are about also understanding class relationships in the modern period, no? I mean, we went to the Tarai area of the Madesh community and we watched the South Africans and the Colombians shocked about the levels of poverty of the Madesh community. I said that the housing assembly were more precarious because I was talking about the leaders and activists, but in terms of the communities, we never saw such marginalization and poverty that, 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 that existed in, in, in that region, no? And so, uh, you know, thinking about the kind of processes through which those communities were marginalized and the kind of enmities between them, this idea of bringing them together, I think was important. But um, no doubt, bringing cultures together that have historically been divided is a very challenging process. And uh, I think we saw um, in periods of repression in Turkey, in like the second phase of the HDK, when the government turned on the movement, that there was less space for the tolerance and respect for all of those organizations. Now, in the early period, it was an open period during the peace process where you could organize collectively out in the open, 
Once the state smashed in, different movements were part of that, started to retreat a little and start to say, hey, we need to protect ourselves. We need to, I don't want to be involved in these. So you start saying, yeah, gender can come late. Ethnicity can come later. We need to sort our own movement out. So those pressures happen because movements are struggling in different contexts and they're, they're again, relational to the state and the state strategies. Um, and in fact, on that, much of the success of the HDK was its capacity to organize an open uh, and, and, and build movement openly. And once the state criminalized the movement, it was very vulnerable because the state knew exactly every single activist across the whole terrain. So one strategy that worked in the beginning actually led to uh, um, putting it under threat later on. No? And I think that's, you know, that's some danger of thinking that there is one solution for movement. Oh, they should all be horizontal. They should all be open. Well, it depends on the context. Yeah? Uh, and when I came to Colombia in the late 1990s, um, the movements also had to organize clandestinely underground because uh, all movements were uh, labeled as terrorist. Uh, um, and as the peace process has gone on in Colombia, movements have been able to organize more openly, to have public meetings, et cetera. And that's, of course, changed the dynamics and changed the levels of participation. Do we have a few questions from Jim as well? Okay, so the first one from online is, um, can I ask to what extent technologies have contributed to the dynamically evolving field in recent times? And how do you anticipate this contributing in the future? Um, so it's, um, uh, can I ask to what extent technologies have contributed to the dynamically evolving field in recent times? And how do you anticipate this contributing in the future? Okay, and the second one is, um, I'd like to know your thoughts on two scenarios um, I have faced um, as a Colombian, um, I, who's proud and happy to see someone at IDS sharing how significant this um, movement was and is for the country. Um, being in LATAM and seeing organizations dismiss Dialogos de Saberas or similar tools because it is not serious enough, which I read as Western enough to catch funds. And then also being in the UK, how can we build bridges to show movements and academics um, here that there are interesting experiences to learn from in LATAM? Yeah, okay, I'll do a third one. Um, could you elaborate if there were any opportunities for transnational learning between grassroots and established forms of activism that share similarities mentioned in the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. I... Oh. Thank you, Mario. I really enjoyed the talk and I look forward to reading the book. Um, and my question is about books in a way. Um, so you opened with a Gramsci quote about the labor of criticism that precedes revolution. And he talked about invisible army of books and pamphlets in revolutionary France. And then also on your research blog, there's a great quote from one of the South African activists participants who says we learn from each other, not from books. So I'm curious about in the various um, cases, what role books or libraries played or did not play in, in the, for, the forms of learning and um, activism. Um, and if, if sort of books and libraries or institutional libraries did not play a part, then could you say something about what other kinds of radical forms of circulating information resources may have worked in their place. Um, and so then in relation to that, I'm curious about how your book will reach the people involved in the studies. Um, so yeah, books versus alternative radical forms of knowledge and information sharing. Thank you very much. In the next round, I will collect the books. Um, yeah, I might, I might take this question of technology and books together and think about different ways of, um, 
of learning that we saw across the movement. Of course, we also went through this process of uh, a COVID uh, rapid understanding of Zoom, both in our organizational stuff, but of course in our teaching. Um, um, in terms of the movements, uh, the early stages of the uh, early 2000s in Colombia, uh, technology of uh, walkie-talkies was the way that activists would uh, communicate with each other, often um, supplied by human rights organizations um, to threatened uh, activists. Um, and as that has moved along, of course, the whole WhatsApp has become very uh, um, well used across lots of the uh, movements that we uh, were engaged in. Um, I think I mentioned that Colombia has gone through two phases, uh, the early phase authoritarian control, uh, which doesn't favor the mass communication and production of those kind of uh, information to a more communicative phase. And uh, the Intercultural University of the Peoples, if you go onto their website of Nomades, you'll see videos, videos are their mechanisms. Um, their argument is Colombians don't read. And I think that was what I was thinking about. I mean, um, as, a, as a teacher, I'm struggling to make my students read these days. And as a father, I'm struggling to make my children read. And so I do think there is a real challenge about reading. Um, in the Madesh case, the Nemaf, in the early phases, um, they focused a lot on the production of knowledge about Madesh history. Um, that was kind of eliminated from the historical archives. Um, so they produced a range of books talking about the history, which were widely read and widely distributed. Um, and, you know, there is an argument there that it was that it was that kind of increased sensitivity to those issues, probably through the books, but also through the presentations of those in public fora that led to that. So I think the separation between the text and the presentation of the text, I think, is also worth reflecting on in these kind of act activist circles, um, because the text is often the mechanism through which then people come together and share that knowledge in different ways. Um, but I, 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 you know, um, 20, 20 years ago, nearly, um, I did my first book on social movements and labor movement learning. I was a new academic and I negotiated the worst deal in history with Routledge. Um, and the book was sold at 78 pounds at that time, yeah, which guaranteed that nobody would ever have access to it unless they had access through a university, no. Um, with this one, we started early stage with Pluto Press, it's low cost anyway, but Pluto Press, as you probably know, offers this 80% discounts on eBooks all the time. And we're also negotiating through the university to have it free online permanently. Um, so we hope that that would get access. But as I was saying in the beginning, um, when we talked about this process in the early days, we asked what movements wanted out of it, the different types of movements. And through that process, we produced different texts in different languages, uh, translations of texts, uh, the book of the case study in Turkish, um, uh, translations in Spanish. So we have in different languages, um, but we also produce some videos uh, about, you know, different stages of that to try to get access. Um, COVID came and sucked the time and all the money. We had to give back money from the project because we couldn't spend it in the time that we had, which would have been some of this dissemination. So now we're trying to use, grab little bits and pieces. But I think that's really an excellent question about um, where kind of written texts exist in that. And I often think about that, <laughs> the pain of producing them, whether anybody reads them, you know, and whether, you know, podcasts, these kind of things have become much more popular. Um, and I kind of have a kind of scattergun uh, approach to that uh, these days. Um, but certainly, I think in our movements, we've seen a variety of said many of the members of HDK are actually heads of uh, critical journals. No, then there's a big market for critical journals in, in Turkey. Um, so I think that the written word is not yet dead, uh, but. Um, 
Yeah, well, that would be great, yeah. Um, we're talking about translation of the book and, and publication of it in, in, in several different languages, but audio book would be, would be amazing, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I've completely forgotten the other questions now. So um, you answered technology, so there was a question from you about uh, combining um, um, resources for oh, yeah. the exchange of knowledge. Uh, and two scenarios, dialogue with the experience is an interesting experience. Um, how to get people to think about learning from other places now. I mean, I've been a, a kind of trade union activist for several decades now. And um, I've always, you know, my formative experiences were in Colombia, politically. I feel like I learned a lot during the years when I was working inside a trade union in Cali after I was a teacher there. Um, and since then, I was a, a founder of the Columbia Solidarity Campaign, a, a movement that works with Colombians in the UK and, and, and engages on, on political issues. And we often found a real difficulty with working with UK organizations, um, particularly trade unions, British trade unions that thought that they were there to teach or to finance or to support, but not to learn from those movements. And I thought, well, you know, here you've got a case in Colombia of a movement um, preceding Nomades that had resisted privatization of water, electricity, telecommunications. For the UK, there's probably lots to learn there, yeah? As we privatize more or less most things. But there is the reproduction of historical mindsets around colonialism, the history of you know, knowledge and things that's really challenging to overcome. I feel that there have been some shifts in the way that people see that, much more interest in uh, actions, you know, that I, I talked about interest in Venezuela, Rojava, a whole range of different movements that I think um, perhaps is challenging that. And, you know, I've, I've worked with an organization called War on Want for the last um, 30 years, but recently as a, on, as a member of the trustees. And the organization was set up in the 1950s to work on process of international solidarity. And part of that uh, movement's rationale is precisely to try to bring in stories, struggles from outside, and to raise issues around UK Western imperialism and, the, uh, and its roles now. Um, but I, I do think that there is a challenge of that, but maybe not, not amongst students, more amongst institutions. I feel that students are interested in many of these uh, uh, issues. Um, and then finally, the issue of transnational movements. I mean, I mentioned already this um, links between HDK and Nomadesk Inter Intercultural University of the People. I think there was real learning processes that went on there. Um, I feel that uh, the connections that were built during this brief process, though, because actually the, the connection lasted for two years and then COVID came and stopped that face-to-face -face communication. But it, it, it was a really important period where people were starting to learn about each other's struggles. Um, and I do believe that, um, you know, that's at the heart of, of, of international solidarity is that kind of sharing of experiences. And we tried to do that. You know? um, one of the leaders of uh, um, the HDK that we began with uh, doing the research, he was arrested within weeks of the start of the project in prison for several months. And we organized across the movement, signing petitions. We went to his court case. Uh, we spoke publicly in solidarity and th these things I think were important to build those links but um, one shouldn't forget that we were a multilingual team that facilitated communication and even in that process with all of our linguistic capacities it was really tricky I mean I remember being in Nepal and we were talking with one of the Madesh leaders and he just stood up and he got so angry and he said, this guy is not listening to me. He's whispering in the ear of another person. But I was simultaneously translating from English to Spanish so that the uh, Colombian colleague could listen. And the difficulty of all that tr those translation processes, we were moving sometimes between four languages, was very, very, very difficult. No? So there are obstacles to transnational solidarity, which, you know, perhaps um, explain why the focus in Latin America now is much more regional 
than it is international. There's much more building on common languages and engagement. Um, not to say that, you know, all continents are monolingual, of course, they depend, but in, in Latin America, the case um, that there has been much more processes of, of regional solidarity perhaps reflects that, but it also may reflect a shift to endogenous thinking and thinking of a Latin American solutions to Latin American problems, rather than seeing kind of external ideas and thinking, although in most of our research we found a fusion between uh, uh, ideas, both endogenous and also external, and uh, a mix between Marxism and uh, endogenous thinking were fused together. Um, Thank you, Mark. We'll collect the last round of questions. Okay, so there was one question. Oh, that's suddenly a lot of questions. Um, okay, we have eight Five minutes. minutes. Um, so Nimi first, uh, and yeah, that was uh, Divya, uh, and your question then? Um, so it's kind of just about the hierarchies of how it's working together. Um, I'm interested in the political and moral complexities and dynamics within the social movements and the So I think you selected the social movements practically in form of where they're situated politically. Um, but you noted that there was something in common dynamic making that people had to look, do some learning in the movement. And that made me think about how there are also social movements that are, do not have a rigid emancipatory politics. So how sometimes the politics of despair and the politics of death. Um, and there are two examples I can think of is in South Africa, for example, with Operation Rebuilder which is organizing pogroms against working class people from other African and Asian countries, uh, mass pogroms, mass killings. And then we can think about how, for example, in India, Hitler's Mighty Front is a bestseller with the book of War in the RSS, uh, which is a fascist organization. Mm. So, uh, and she can make it in So I'm curious, like, how, <laughs> you know, these kinds of more, with, with the, this different kinds of politics, how do you imagine them? This might then have to shape how might be connected to this kind of social media kind of Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is on if you had any reflections on the engagement between academics and feminists within these contexts. With social movements, both at a practical level, but also in terms of how the movements may have pushed um, academic work and movement identity in its own way. Thank you. And the last question, please, over there. My question about the language in the shift in the whole of the social movements, and that this kind of political party, and after taking that down part of it, then there is this middle of fight for power, and then you know, against my whole world, they speed up and you know, do that for them. Okay, and you have five minutes to answer those two questions. <laughs> according to my watch, and I will keep my questions for the drink session. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think that's a, a, um, Nimi's question. I'll start with Nimi's uh, comment um, that, of course, social movements are not necessarily progressive, and our connections were not carefully chosen. My friends were carefully chosen, yeah. <laughs> and I trust my friends. So all of those movements emerge from connections long sustained connections between different movements so in a sense that uh, you know they weren't selected for comparable case studies etc and i said we, these are four movements they're interesting we know friends that are engaged with those organizations let's bring them together and see what they have to say but i think that's very interesting and uh, um, understanding the pedagogies of reactionary movements would be very interesting research that I will not undertake. <laughs> uh, 
life's too short but yeah i think that's good and of course searchlight and others you know have done that stuff around uh, fascist movements historically and looking at the role of that but certainly those movements are on the rise around the world and it would be interesting to understand a little bit more of the kind of pedagogies uh, of, of those processes and, and and a good point around the difficulties to yeah not romanticize social movements and in the book we really don't romantic I might have romanticized a little bit today but generally in the book we we, we also recognize those challenges and some of the internal struggles and battles and uh, and processes um on the question of the role of universities within this process, I mean, I started off with that here now, the argument of bringing movements in, bringing Kurdish communities in, which we did for this process under the previous reign of Adam Tikal. Uh, and we tried hard to, um, to think about that process and um, of making the university welcoming for people that don't necessarily engage with the university. Um, and I think there are some places that do that better than others, yeah? I don't have a great deal of, because we didn't do research on that relationship, I don't know so much about many, maybe Bilgu can talk about the relationship between Turkey and social movements uh, in the university, but certainly in Colombia, my experience was quite a close relationship. The student movements are often at the heart of political struggles. Um, and therefore, most organizations that operate politically have their spaces inside universities. No? The university is often a political space. And we see that Cali, Colombia, uh, the uh, public university in Cali has been a hotbed of much of these organizational processes. And Nomades, uh, many of the leaders of that are working in the university, not necessarily as academics. There is a trade union of janitors, Sintronicol, which is extremely progressive trade union that has been organizing and working with students. So it's not only academics that could mobilize here, it was also um, general trade union. Um, so I'm, I have experience of that, but I think Latin American culture has this idea of the extension university, that the engagement with the community, a rationale around that, which other places don't necessarily have, Yeah, but I, I can't. I can't speak to that so much. And then finally, uh, we have that difficult question about, I guess what you're suggesting is that those movements that look progressive in the beginning transform themselves when they get into power and reproduce, which, which essentially was um, Mamdani's argument around uh, the need for the post-national state, because he argued that uh, ethnic group, uh, that the relationship between ethnicity and state, the dominant ethnic group takes control of the state, then the oppositional ethnic group fights to take control. And when it does, it hammers the other ethnic group. And therefore he argues for the separation of that. Um, Colombia now is an example of, we'll see what happens. No, the, uh, the current government brings together all of those different organizations and is trying to build a process. So I don't think it's automatic, um, but again, it's about accountability and responsibility. Um, the earlier processes of the responsibility of the politician, the elected politician and the grassroots member uh, is often the issue in electoral processes and in within the HDK and the HDP, there has been that tension, because often if you get elected as a politician, you get your salary, you get uh, some benefits, but they brought in rules, no, only one term, two terms maximum. Yeah, and then you would rotate. So it avoided some of these processes. So there are mechanisms and they also introduced gender quotas, one woman, one man, shared roles in all major positions. There are a range of things I think you can do to try to ensure that these things don't, well, not automatically successful, it has to be said, but uh, possible. Okay. Yeah. Argentina, you close. Uh, I mean, you have big, big yeah. 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 And then you have two movements, uh, Movimiento Evita, the Polo Obrero, and they actually, they started after the default, 2001, they had very uh, kind of power, blah, blah, and now they become part of the system. Of the system with self center left, and yeah. actually in the previous government of Martin, which was a crime in Argentina, they actually didn't take the people in the system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're talking about 
they need a beep. Yeah. So they, it can be, but that's part of the economy. Yeah, no. It's, I, a, different, it's a different political yeah, mentality. But of okay. course. Should, uh, Okay. Maybe we can continue this. We can, we can, we can. So, we can. Thank you so much to Maria, but also to our audience for wonderful questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Classics development lectures are continuing next week as well, if you would like to kind of join. Okay, thank you. I'm closing the section now. Thank you so much for the for our organizers. Too.